بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو مائی یوٹیوب چینل ڈائیورسٹی آف پلانٹ زون ان دس چینل یو کین گیٹ ایوری انفارمیشن ریلیٹڈ ٹو دا پلانٹس اینڈ دیئر ڈائیورسٹی تھرو آؤٹ دا ورلڈ بفور اسٹارٹنگ دس ویڈیو آئی ریکویسٹ یو آل ٹو پلیز سبسکرائب مائی یوٹیوب چینل دس چینل نیڈس یور اسپورٹ ان دا فارم آف یور فیڈبیکس comments, subscription and likes. Today's topic of my video is about morphology of leaf, part 5. Today I will discuss its fifth part. I hope that you will like this video. So let's start the video. Today I will discuss about the modifications of leaves. Modifications of leaves. In many plants, the leaves are wholly or partially modified to carry on the special functions. The recognition of leaf becomes obscure as a result of the modification. However, whether a particular modification is that of a leaf or not can be ascertained from number one leaf tendrils in leaf tendrils the whole leaf or more commonly the parts of the leaves are modified into slender sensitive tendrils for climbing the whole lamina in the lathyrus or wild pea, the terminal leaflets in pea, and the apex in the gloriosa, which is also known as the bee alert chandel, the petiole in the clematis, and the stipules in the smilex, which is also known as the bee comerica, are modified into tendrils. In some climbing plants, the leaves or parts of leaves are modified into tendrils. For example, in wild pea, and wild pea is also called as the Lithyris sefaca. The whole leaf is specialized to form a tendril, and the enlarged stipule carry on the functions of the leaf. Next modification of the leaf is leaf spines. The lamina or a part of it may be modified into hard, sharp pointed structure which is known as the spine for the purpose of the self-defense. In common, a pancha which is also known as the bee fani manasha. The stem becomes green and flattened which is also known as the philoclate and the leaves are converted into the spines. Similarly, the apex of the date palm and the margin of the argemon, which is also known as the bee, shialcanta. The stipules in the acacia, which is also known as bee babla, is modified into spines. And it should be noted that the thrones and spines carry on the same function but the thrones are modified stems and the spines are modified leaves. The curved sharp pointed outgrowths of the roses are called as the prickles. In many plants, the entire leaves or parts of the leaves are modified into spines which help in reducing the transpiration and also act as a protective organs for example in the barberry which is also known as the barbarous. The leaves on the main stem are reduced to three branch spines, in the axles of which short shoots bearing the foliage leaves in the small clusters are present. Sometimes the leaf apex or the leaf margin may get modified into a spiny structure which is known which is also present in the agave. So the next modification of the leaves is the storage leaves. So the many leaves become fleshy and succulent due to the storage of the water and food. 
Here, the leaves are partially modified. Leaves of agave, aloe, and portulaca, which is also known as B. noon shark. The scaly leaves of the onion are the familiar examples. Next modification of leaves is insect catching leaves. The insectivorous plants have the peculiar leaves nicely adopted for catching the insects. And the first modification is the nepenthes which is also known as the pitcher plant. Here the leaf base is modified into a flat lamina like body. The petiole into a slender coiled tendril for climbing and the lamina into the pitcher proper. The pitcher has a colored hood for attracting the insects. In insectivorous or insect eating plants, for example, in the pitcher plant, which is also known as the nepenthes, the leaf is modified into a pitcher which serves to capture and digest the insects. Next modification is utricularia or bladderwort. The bladderworts, which is also known as the bee, Janji have much dissected compound leaves. Some of the leaflets are modified into bladders having the special devices for catching insects. Each bladder has a valve like door which opens only inwards. The small aquatic insects push in the valve and are caught. In course of time, they die and the bodies are digested. In bladderwort and insectivorous water plant, the leaves are divided into the segments and some of which are modified to form the bladders containing the digestive enzymes. Next modification of leaves is called as the drosera or sundew. It is an other insectivorous plant where a spatula shaped leaves bear many tentacles the tips of which glisten in the sun and look like the dew drops small insects are attracted come and rest on the leaf only to find the tentacles bent and imprison them by the secretion of the enzymes, the insect body is decomposed. After completing digestion, the tentacles resume their original position and get ready for another prey. Next modification of the leaves is the leaves of bryophyllum. The leaves of bryophyllum, which are also known as B. Pata, Kochi. The begonia bear the epiphyllus birds and thus help in the vegetative multiplication. Next modification of the leaf is the phyllodes. So in some species of the Australian acacias, the leaf blade is completely missing and petioles become flattened and grow vertically. These are known as the phyllodes. Next modification of the leaf is the storage organs. In some cases, for example, as we can see in onion. Onion bulbs, the leaves are modified into the storage organs. So the next modification of leaves are floral parts. The floral parts, for example, sepal, petals, stamens, and carpels. These are also modified leaves. Next modification of the leaves is bird scales. Leaves may be reduced to the sessile, short, thick scales to protect the meristematic tissue. And these are known as the bird scales. Next modification of leaves is the leaflet hooks. In some cases, the leaflets may get modified into hooks. For example, in the bignonia, the terminal leaflets are modified into hooks 
and these help the plants in climbing. So these are the different modifications of the leaves. In the modifications of the leaves, the first modification is the tendrils and the example is the pisum or pisum. Next modification is spines and the example is the zizifus. Next modification is the hooks and example is the bignonia. Next modification is the leaf bladder and example is the utricularia. Next modification is storage leaves and example is aloe. Next is the picture and example is the nepenthes. Next modification is phyllote and example is acacia. Next modification is floral leaves and example is the dalonyx. These are all the modifications of the leaves as shown in this figure. So, in modifications of the leaves, the first modification is leaf tendrils. These are the leaf tendrils as shown in the figure. In weak stemmed plants, the leaf or a part of the leaf get modified into the green thread-like texture, which is known as the tendrils and which help in the climbing around the spot as shown in the figure. Again, this is a leaf tendril. So, leaf tendrils exist in plants with the weak stems. The leaves get modified into the thread-like stitches which are called th tendrils. And these tendrils climb a nearby stick or wall and provide the support to the plant. For example, in the Lathyrus effecta, the whole leaf is modified into tendrils. The upper leaflets of the Pisum stivum get modified into tendrils, as shown in the figure. Again, this is a Lathyrus effecta, and the leaf is modified into a tendril. This is a leaf tendril, a thread-like texture, as you can see in this figure and this is a stipule as shown in the figure. Here, the stem is very weak and hence they have some special organs for attachment to the sport. The tendril is a slender, wiry, cold texture which helps in climbing the sport. In the thyrus, the entire leaf is modified into the tendril. In Smilex, the stipules become modified into tendril. As shown in the figure, so the second modifications of the leaves is the leaf spines. In this figure, you can see the different kinds of the leaf spines in the Apentia, in Ulex, and in the Barbary as shown in the figure. So leaf spines, a few plants have their leaves modified into needle-like texture known as the spines. The spines act as defensive textures and they also reduce the water loss due to the transpiration. For example, in a pencha, the leaves are modified into the spines as shown in the figure. So, again, this is the leaf spines in the acacia. This is a acacia plant as shown in this figure. In this type, the leaves become wholly or partially modified into sharp pointed textures known as spines. This modification helps the plant to cut down transpiration and also protects the plants against the attacks of the grazing animals. Any part of the leaf may get modified into spine, for example, in Zizifus or in Acacia as shown in the figure. So again, these are leaf spines. There are three figures. In the first figure, this is D, Barbarous. 
Barbarous includes the branched leaf spine and this is the stem. In second figure, you can see that this is a aloe and aloe contains the spiny apex and marginal spines are also present in it. In the figure C, you can see that this is the Argemon Mexicana and it includes the marginal spines as shown in this figure. So leaf spines, in some plants the leaves are modified into sharp pointed spines and they help in reducing the rate of transpiration. In xerophytic plants and also protect the plants from the herbivorous animals as shown in the figure. So again these are the leaf spines and uh, there are two figures. In the figure A you can see that this is the Barbary and it contains the branched leaf spine. It has stem and these are the leaves of the condensed axillary shoot. And in the figure B this is the spine cluster as shown in the figure B. And figure B is of the cactus as shown in the figure. So leaves are modified into the spines to reduce the water loss like the cactus. In prickly poppy, the leaves bear the spines on the margin, as shown in the figure. Next modification of the leaf is the storage leaves. So the xerophytic plants and plants belonging to the family of Cresciolaceae have thick and succulent leaves that store water in their tissues. The parenchymatous cells of these leaves have large vacuoles which are filled with the hydrophilic colloid. This modification helps the plant to resist the desiccation as shown in the figure. Again, these are the storage leaves of the aloe. So they are packed tightly into a flower pot like structure that catches falling water and debris. These leaves have the parenchymatous cells with a big central vacuole filled with the hydrophilic colloid. So this is the storage leaves of the aloe as shown in the figure. Again, this is the storage leaves of the agave. These leaves are modified to store the water and or nutrients for the plant. One example is aloe. There are about 500 species in this genus and most of them are drought resistant. Aloe vera is cultivated as a medicinal plant and the leaves are used to treat the sunburn among the other things as shown in the figure. So again, these are the storage leaves of the dragon's blood sedum. So some plants of the saline and xerophytic habitats and members of the family Cresciolaceae commonly have the fleshy or swollen leaves. These succulent leaves store the water, mucilage and store food material. Such storage leaves resist the desiccation and the examples are aloe, agave, bryophyllum, calanchoe, sedum and sueda and Brassica oleracea, which is a cabbage variety capitata, as shown in the figure. So next time I'm going to discuss the different types of the insect catching plants. This is another modification of the leaves. And there are five plants you can see in this figure. I'm going to discuss them one by one. So first is the snap trap which is also known as Venus fly trap. In this plant, in Venus fly trap, catch the spiders and insects by snapping their trap leaves and this mechanism is activated when unsuspecting prey touch highly sensitive trigger the hairs twice within the 30 seconds. A study has now shown that a single slow touch also triggers the trap cloia, probably to catch the slow moving larvae and the snails. And the next plant is the pitfall trap which is also known as the pitcher plant. 
So pitcher plants produce the pitfall traps and drive from the leaves to attract, capture, retain, kill and digest the animal prey, usually insects to enable them to survive in the nutrient poor environment. So the next plant is the bladder trap which is also known as utricularia or bladder warts. So bladder warts trap the small organisms in their tiny bladders which have a trap door that is triggered by the hairs on the door. So when prey comes in contact with the hairs, the door opens in a millisecond, sucking the animal in and closing in about 2.5 milliseconds. The primary food is water flies and mosquito larvae. And the next plant is the fly paper trap, which is also known as sundew. So sundews are fly paper plants that trap the prey in sticky hairs on their leaves. They make up one of the largest groups of the carnivorous plants, long tentacles protrude from their leaves and each with a sticky gland at the tip. These droplets look like dew glistening in the sun and thus their name. The glands produce the nectar to attract the prey, powerful adhesive to trap it and enzymes to digest it. So once an insect becomes stuck nearby tentacles, coal around the insect and smother it. Sentius can reach a height up to the 10 inches, which is about 25 centimeters. However, the some species are tall and with a wine-like appearance while the others hug the ground and making their size variable. So the next plant is the lobster pot trap which is also known as the Genelacea or corkscrew plants. In these plants, lobster pot traps are found predominantly in the corkscrew plants and the genus is the gene lacia. Employ the downward pointing hairs to force spray deeper into the trap. On the adaxial surface and gene lacia, the corkscrew plant has tubular leaves and forked subsurface traps with the opening spiraling along the branches of the fork as shown in the figure. So next time I'm going to discuss the further about the modifications of the leaves and first I'm going to discuss about the Nepenthes or pitcher plant which is an insect catching plant. So in Nepenthes or pitcher plant this is a tropical pitcher plant which is also known as Nepenthes plant. It is a carnivorous plant which is native to the Southeast Asia. So the pitcher plants are named for the pitchers at the end of each leaf that are filled with the digestive fluid to catch the bugs as shown in the figure. So again this is a Nepenthes or pitcher plant. So Nepenthes which are commonly referred to as the tropical Asian pitchers has a very unique appearance. The plant has normal looking leaves but at the tip of the each leaf is where a pitcher forms. A tendril will develop at the tip of the plant leaf and as the leaf matures the tendril will lengthen and eventually develop into a fully mature pitcher. Each pitcher also secretes the nectar along the rim peristome to attract the insects and once an insect falls in it drawns into the naturally produced fluids that contain the digestive enzymes as shown in the figure. Again this is the Nepenthes or pitcher plant. So Nepenthes is a tropical pitcher plant is a genus of carnivorous plants in the monotypic family Nepenthesiae. The pitcher is actually a swelling of the midvein in the leaf. 
and insects are attracted to them because of their nectar secretions and coloration. The slippery rim peristome and inner walls of the pitcher encourage the insects to fall into the digestive fluid at the bottom of the trap and nutrients are absorbed from this soup as shown in the figure. Next modification of the insect catching plant is the utricularia or bladder wart. So bladder wart, the genus is utricularia. Genus of the carnivorous plants in the family Lentibulariaceae and the order is the Lamiales. The bladder wart genus contain about 220 widely distributed species of the plants which are characterized by the small hollow cells, sacs that actively capture and digest the tiny animals such as insect larvae, aquatic worms and the water fleas. As shown in the figure. So this is again the utricularia or bladder wart Bladder warts are an, an extraordinarily specialized and widespread group of the carnivorous plants. They produce the tiny balloon-like traps that capture the minute prey in the soil. They are easy to grow and their lovely flowers are often compared to the orchids. As shown in the figure, again this is a utricularia or bladder wart. So, utricularia, which is commonly known as the bladder warts, are a type of the carnivorous plants that gets its name from the bladder-like traps it uses to capture the prey. And these traps are made up of the tiny hollow sacs that are lined with the hairs. So when an unsuspecting insect brushes against one of these hairs, it triggers the bladder, the bladder wart to open and creating a vacuum that sucks the insect inside. So once the bladder wart has captured its prey, it envelops the insect in digestive enzymes, eventually reducing it to a nutrient-rich soup that the plant can absorb. So bladder warts are found in freshwater habitats all over the world and they come in both floating and terrestrial varieties as shown in the figure so next modification of the insect catching plants is the drosera or sundew so drosera which is commonly known as the sundews is one of the largest genera of carnivorous plants with at least 194 species these members of the family Drosaraceae, Drosaraceae, lure, capture and digest insects by using their stalked mucilaginous glands and covering their leaf surfaces. The insects are used to supplement the poor mineral nutrition to the soil in which the plants grow. So various species which vary greatly in the size and form are native to every continent except the Antarctica as shown in the figure. Again this is the Drosera or Sundew. So Sundews can be small as a piney or large as a small bush. Their tentacle covered leaves come in a white and imaginative variety of design. Circular leaves, wedge shaped leaves, leaves that are peltate or linear or as filiform as a thin blade of grass. Their leaves may be strapped, shaped, oval or forked and branching like a fern or lethal spider web as shown in the figure. Again, this is the Drosera or Sundew. So Sundews or Drosera utilize what is called a flypaper trapping mechanism to engage in carnivory. The plants produce the leaves which are covered in tentacles that secrete the sticky droplets of the drew of the dew in order to attract and catch the bugs. 
as shown in the figure. So again, this is the Drosera or Sundew, the Sundew plant, which is also known as the Drosera. So Drosera plant is one of the most diverse of all carnivorous plants. Sundew plants like the Drosera capensis or cap sundew and Drosera alicii can be found in the South Africa. While Drosera binata and a huge variety of the pygmy sundew can be found in Australia as shown in this figure. So the next modification of the leaves is the leaves of the bryophyllum. The leaves of the bryophyllum produces the adventitious birds that develop from the leaf margin. So as the leaves fall on the moist soil, it produces the new plants directly from the leaves by forming the roots inside the soil. As shown in the figure. So, again, these are the leaves of the bryophyllum and in this figure you can see that these are the leaf birds or adventitious birds as shown in this figure. So several plants produce the tiny but complete plantlets along their margins. Each plantlet when separated from the leaves is capable of growing independently into a full sized plant. Such leaves are known as reproductive leaves, as shown in the figure. Again, these are the leaves of the bryophyllum. So, bryophyllum is a plant whose leaves produce the adventitious birds in their margin. So, the adventitious birds grow into the new plants when they fall off from the parent plant, as shown in this figure. Again, you can see these are the leaves of the bryophyllum, the leaf of bryophyllum with the birds. In this figure, you can see these are the adventitious birds and these are the young plant developed from the adventitious bird as shown in this figure. So, bryophyllum is a plant genus which is found in the tropical and in subtropical regions of the world. In this plant, the leaves are fleshy and succulent to store the food and water. They are oval in shape. The succulent nature of these leaves provides the nutrition to the tiny plantlets which develop on the margins of these leaves. And these plantlets detach from the leaf and root to form a new adult plant as shown in the figure. So next modification of the leaf is the phyllode in the acacia suaviolens as shown in this figure. So phyllode, a phyllode resembles cladodes and phylloclades but refers to a flattened petiole that resembles a leaf blade rather than a narrow stalk as shown in this figure. So again this is a phyllode in the Australian acacia. So in Australian acacia the patiole or any part of the rachis becomes flattened or winged taking the shape of the leaf and turning green in color. This flattened or winged patiole or rachis is known as the phyllode. The normal leaf which is finitely compound in nature develops in the seedling stage but it soon falls off. The phyllode then performs the functions of the leaf. In some species however young or even adult the plants are seen to bear the normal compound leaves together with the phyllodes as shown in this figure. So again you can see this is the phyllode in the acacia mangium. 
a modified petiole in some plants in which the petiole is characteristically flattened, resembling and performing functions which are similar to a true leaf, even replacing the true leaves as major photosynthetic structure in the certain plant groups, as shown in this figure. Again, this is the phenols of the acacia. In this figure, you can very clearly see the phenols of the acacia. So, when patiole or secondary rachis is modified into green flattened winged texture, which is performing the photosynthesis, it is called a phyllode. An example is the acacia melanoxylon. In acacia melanoxylon, the petiole is modified into a phyllode. In this, the normal leaf, which is bipolately compound, develops in the seedling stage, but it soon falls off. The phyllode then performs the photosynthesis as shown in the figure. Next modification of the leaves is the onion bulb as storage organs. In this figure, you can see the onion bulb and onion is also known as the allium sepa. And onion bulb contains the remains of the previous aerial growth. These are scale leaves. This is the fleshy leaves and this is stem and the stem is also called as bulb. These are roots and this is the lateral bud. So bulb in botany, a modified stem that is the resting stage of certain seed plants, particularly the perennial monocotyledons. A bulb consists of a relatively large, usually globe-shaped underground bud with the membranous or fleshy overlapping leaves which are arising from a short stem. A bulb's fleshy leaf, which in some species are actually expanded leaf bases, functions as the food reserves that enable a plant to lie dormant when water is unavailable during the winter or drought and resume its active growth when the favorable conditions again prevail as shown in the figure. So again this is the onion bulb as storage organ. In this figure you can clearly see a onion bulb, an onion bulb and it contains the tunic. These are the scales or leaf bases. This is bud. This is the basal plate and in the last you can see these are roots. So the leaves of the onions are modified and become thick and fleshy to store the food and water. The inner leaves are fleshy while the outer ones are dry. This is called as tunicated bulb since the concentric leaf bases form a complete covering or tunic as shown in this figure. Again this is an onion bulb as storage organs. In this figure you can very clearly see the parts of an onion. In the first figure you can see this is a bulb and these are adventitious roots. In the second figure you can see these are the scale leaves, these are fleshy leaves and these are lateral birds. This is the stem and this is the terminal bird as shown in the figure. So basically the bulb of an onion is formed from the modified leaves. Like plant cells, the onion cells have a rigid cell wall and a cell membrane enclosing the cytoplasm and nucleus. So there are about seven parts of an onion. The first part is the scaly leaves. So the scaly leaves are the first part you can see when you pick up an onion. So it's the dried up and crinky leaves that you peel away before you use the onion. So they are rougher, thinner and less shiny than the fleshy leaves. Despite being very thin, each scale leaf is still considered a separate layer. So scaly leaves started out like a normal fleshy leaves. Along the way the outer leaves dry 
out and become the papery thin and this gives the more room for the inner leaves to grow in size as the plant matures. The scaly leaves of the bulb are incapable of performing the photosynthesis. Instead, the scaly leaves serve two main functions and the first function is the storage and the second is protection. So many underground plants have the covers to protect them against the insects and the soil friction. It adds a barrier to resist the insects and erosion. To some extent, the scaly leaves are capable of storing the water and nutrients. After all, they started as fleshy leaves. The scaly leaves might not be tasty as fleshy layers. However, the dried onion peel is rich in flavonoids. So you can use it for an extra punch of the flavoring soups and rice and bread. And the next part of the onion bulb is the fleshy leaves. So onion is perhaps one of the most important onion plants for the humans. All thanks to the fleshy leaves. These fleshy leaves are the second part of the onion bulb and they are more pulp and rich in active constituents. The onion's fleshy leaves did not contain chlorophyll and they are not capable of photosynthesis. So if they did, they have the chlorophyll and it wouldn't matter much. Remember that the onion bulbs grow underground away from the sunlight. The main function of the fleshy onion leaves is storage. And many of the active constituents in the fleshy leaves are antioxidants. So here's a list of the top nutrients which are stored in the onion leaves. So it contains the flavonoids, anthocyanins, dimethyl sulfate, water, vitamins B and C, minerals which include magnesium, calcium, iron, potassium, phosphorus and zinc. And propanethyl S oxide is also present in it. Third part of the onion bulb is the terminal bud. So inside all the leaves there's a little hard bulge that's called the terminal bud. Instead of being on the top of a vertical stem, it's enclosed within the bulb sitting on a disc shaped condensed stem. So when we say the terminal burrs we mean those at the end of the vertically growing end. So however since the onions are bulbs, underground stems, things are a little bit different here. So the birds are the bunch of the embryonic cells waiting for an opportunity to divide and take the form. Their main function is to help the plant to grow. In case of the onions, the terminal bird has the potential to form a new flowering shoot. This process is called vegetative propagation and it might not be common knowledge but onions are flowering plants. So onions are biennials and they spend the first year storing the nutrients and water. By the second year, the terminal birds would be ready to produce the flowering shoots. The terminal birds can open up to around a meter long inflorescence of the small flowers. These flowers would later on produce the black seeds of the onion plants. So fourth part of the onion bulb is the axillary birds. So while the onion has one terminal bird, it can have three to six axillary birds. They are usually distributed around the terminal central bird. So both the axillary and the terminal birds are carried on the upper side of the condensed discoid stem. They lay at the bottom of the onion bow and protected by the leaves. So it is estimated that the axillary birds begin to take the form around the same time that the onion leaves start to swell and increase in size. The terminal bird 
allows for the vertical growth and meanwhile the axillary buds are responsible for the lateral growth during the propagation. In light of their main function they might also be referred to as the lateral buds. The lateral shooting from axils is more productive than the vertical growth from the terminal bird. So new branches sprout out from the axils and later they form their own daughter bulbs. So fifth part of the onion bulb is the condensed stem. Condensed stem disc. So we keep saying that the entire onion is a modified stem structure. However, we also agree that the leaves and the birds grow on a disc shaped stem. Well, in onions, there is a condensed mass of the cells that relate to the stem in function. It does the job of supporting other vital parts of the plant and it also delivers the nutrients from the root to the bulb. Sixth part of the onion bulb are adventitious roots. So adventitious roots are thin and they arise from a tuft. They are different from the tap roots. Tap roots are also called as main roots in their member, size and soil, penetration ability. So tap roots can penetrate deep into the soil and they are larger and wider. They also arise from the basal point. Meanwhile, adventitious roots can arise from the leaves, nodes and stems, both aerial and underground. A plant might have multiple tap roots or a single tap root and a bunch of adventitious roots. In onion plants, the adventitious roots replace the tap roots. Typically, the use of adventitious roots is supplementary to the tap root. Sometimes they are even aerial and provide the support to the plant. Since onions have no tap roots, the adventitious root system is the plant's main nutrient supplier. Despite being thin, these roots are capable of absorbing all the plant's water and mineral needs. Seventh part of the onion bulb is the bulb. The onion bulb is made up of the parts discussed above. The bulbs are composed of the shortened, compressed underground stems surrounded by the fleshy modified scale leaves that envelop a central bud at the tip of the stem as shown in the figure. So again, this is a tunicated bulb of onion in the figure A and in the figure B you can see this is the longitudinal section of the bulb. In the figure A, it includes the base of the scape, it has bulb, this is the tunic, and these are adventitious roots. On the other hand, in the figure B, you can see that this is the base of the scape. These are fleshy scale leaf. This is apex, this is disc, and this is axillary bud. And these are adventitious roots as shown in the figure. So next, modification of the leaves is the floor parts. There are different parts of the floor you can see in this figure. So first is the petal which helps in the pollination. Second part is the stamen which is a male reproductive part of the floor and which helps in the reproduction and it includes anther and filament. Next part is sepal and sepal helps in the protection of the floor birds. Next part is the carpal which is a female reproductive part of the floor and it includes the stigma, style, pollen tube, ovary and ovule. This part is known as receptacle and receptacle helps the generation of the floor organs. This is the stem as shown in the figure. So flowers are important in making the seeds and flowers can be made up of different parts but there are some parts that are basic equipment. So the main floor parts are made are the male part which is known as the stamen and the female part which is known as 
pistol or carpal. The stamen has two parts. First is the anther and second is filament. The anthers carry the pollen and these are generally yellow in color. And the anthers are held up by a thread-like part which is called a filament. The pistil or carpal has three parts, stigma, style and ovary. The stigma is the sticky surface at the top of the pistil or carpal. It traps and holds the pollen. The style is a tube-like structure that holds up the stigma. The style leads down to the ovary that contains the ovules. Other parts of the floor that are important are the petals and sepals. So petals attract the pollinators and are usually the reason why we buy and enjoy the floors. The sepals are the green and petal like parts at the base of the floor. Sepals helps to protect the developing bird as shown in the figure. Again these are the floor parts and the first part is stamen which includes the anther and filament. This is petal, this is sepal, this is the pistil which includes the stigma, style and ovary. So flowers are the reproductive part of a flowering plant. They are the most colorful and attractive organ of the plant body. A typical diagram of a flower is divided into four main parts. First is the sepals, second is petals, third is stamen and fourth is carpal and each of them performing the distinct functions. So when a flower has all the four floral parts, it is called a complete flower. A flower missing any one of them is called an incomplete flower. So first part is the sepals. They are modified leaves and they enclose the developing flowers. Sepals are the first essential part that grows in a flower arising from the top of the stem and the functions are providing protection to the young flower birds from an injury by forming a tightly closed area giving structural support to the flower. Second part of the flower is petals. They are modified leaf-like uh, leaf parts that surround the productive, the reproductive organs of the flower. The petals are the brightest and colorful parts of the flower that distinguish them from the other parts. Functions are to protect the reproductive structures in flowers and attracting the pollinators like the insects, for example bees, wasps and butterflies, birds and the other small mammals to transfer the pollen from the male flower to the female reproductive part of the flower. So the next type, next part of the floor is the stamen. So stamen, it is the male reproductive part of the floor. It consists of two main parts. First part is anther. Anther is a yellowish sac like structure which is present at the head of the stamen. And filament. So filament is a slender stalk like structure which is present at the tail of the stamen and functions. Anthers help in producing and storing pollen grains and filaments hold the anther and attaches it to the floor. Next part of the floor is the carpal. So carpal is a female reproductive part of a floor that forms the pistil. A pistil may contain a single carpal or multiple carpals which are fused together and it contains three parts. First part is the stigma, head of the pistil that catches the pollen grains. B is the style. Style is the stalk of the pistil when pollen grains reach the stigma, a tube-like structure grows through the style which is called pollen tube which reaches the ovary. And the next part is the ovary. Ovary is the base of the pistil that holds the eggs or ovules. The ovary later becomes the seed. When the male and female reproductive cells fuse together, thereby forming the embryo, a process which is called fertilization. The functions of ovary are stigma helps in receiving the pollen grains and 
also in their germination. So style sports the stigma and connects it to the ovary and ovary helps in developing, distributing and nourishing the embryo. So as shown in the figure, again these are the parts of the floor. Again these are the floor parts and these are the parts of the floor. In this figure you can see that this is the sepal, green in color. The colorful and the bright part of the floor is known as petal and uh, the female reproductive part of the floor is called carpal or pistil that includes the stigma style and ovary. This is the pedicel. These are the breath. This is filament and anther. Filament and anther both are included in the stamen and the stamen it is the male reproductive part of the floor. So all these are the different parts of the floor and the floors are the reproductive part of the flowering plant. They are the most colorful and attractive organ of a plant body. So a typical diagram of a floor is divided into the four main parts and the first part is sepals, second part is petals, third part is stamen and the fourth is carpal and each of them performing the distinct functions. So when a floor has all the four floral parts, it is called a complete floor. And a floor missing any one of them is called as the incomplete floor. So, I am going to discuss the different parts of the floor one by one. The floor structure is broadly divided into the flooring parts which are often arranged in a walled pattern and the first part of the floor is called as pedicel. So pedicel this is the stalk of the floor. The plants that have a stalk are known as the pedicellate whereas that do not have a stalk are known as the sessile floors. Next part of the floor is known as receptacle. Receptacle, this is the base of the floor and lies above the pedicel. It is actually a modified shoot that forms the floral axis and holds the layers of the floor. And the next part of the floor is called the calyx. So calyx is a collection of sepals and it protects the floor in bird stage. Next part of the floor is known as corolla. So corolla is usually the collection of the petals and petals are used to attract the pollinators and petals can be arranged in actinomorphic symmetry or zygomorphic symmetry. These are gamopetalous and uh, petals wholly or partially fused to form a tube. Next part of the floor is known as the ovary. Ovary usually houses the ovules and based on the position of the ovary with respect to the other floor, the walls can be, um, it can be classified into the three types. The first type of the ovary is perigenous. Second type is the epigenous and uh, the third type is the hypogenous. Next part of the floor is known as androsium. So androsium is the male reproductive part which is containing the one or more stamen. Stamen includes the filament. Filament which holds the anther. And anther is also the part of the stamen. Anther is the pollen producing part which is made up of four chambers and which are called pollen sasses. Often the stamens fuse to form a staminal tube. Next part of the floor is known as gynosium which is a female reproductive part of the floor and it includes the stigma. Stigma is sticky or hairy and to, the, and to trap the pollens. And style. Style attaches the stigma to the ovary as shown in this figure. 
so again these are the different parts of the floor and I'm going to discuss each part of the floor one by one the parts of a typical floor includes the stamen which is a major productive part and which includes anther and filament next part of the floor is known as pistol and pistol is also called as carpo which includes stigma style and ovary next part of the floor is the petals and petals forms the corolla next part is the sepals and sepals forms the calyx and this is the ovule and this one is the receptacle so the first part of the floor is known as receptacle receptacle the part of a floor stalk where the parts of the floor are attached with each other that is known as the receptacle next part of the floor is known as sepal sepal is the outer part of the floor which is often green and leaf like that encloses the developing bird next part of the floor is known as petal petal the parts of a floor that are often conspicuously colored next part of the floor is stamen stamen the pollen producing part of the floor usually with a slender filament sporting the anther next part of the floor is known as anther the part of the stamen where the pollen is produced is called as anther next part of the floor is known as pistil or carpal so the ovule producing part of the floor the ovary often sports along the style topped by a stigma the mature ovary is a fruit and the mature ovule is a seed next part of the floor is known as the filament and filament holds the anther next part of the floor is called as the stigma stigma the part of the pistil where the pollen grain germinates next part of the floor is known as the style style attaches the stigma to ovary next part of the floor is known as ovary the enlarged basal portion of the pistil where the ovules are produced next part of the floor is known as ovule ovule it is a plant structure that develops into a seed when fertilized so these are all the parts of the floor as shown in the figure next i'm going to discuss the next modification of the leaf this is known as bud scales as shown in this figure bud scales are modified leaves they may be hairy sticky depending on the species of the plant a common location for a bird scale is on a terminal bird the bird at the end of the branch which controls the dormancy for the other birds on the same branch using the bird scales people can sometimes determine how old a given branch is as the number of the scales will indicate how many times the terminal bird has broken the dormancy as shown in this figure again this is a bird scale so a bird scale is a structure which is found on some plants which protects the birds while they are in dormancy or while they are forming so the plants which form the birds without scales are said to have naked birds reflecting the fact that the birds are not protected so when the birds break the dormancy or open up the bird scales drop away or enlarge and droop to the side allowing the bird to emerge fully so the bird scales which drop the leaf behind distinctive makings known as the bird scales so it can be important to determine whether or not a plant has a bird scale when using a plant identification key as the scales can be used as an identifying feature to distinguish between the different types of the plants identifying the bird scales can also be important when examining the plants to see how well they are when examine they are weathering over the winter and in identifying the early signs of the disease one problem with the protection 
provided by a bird scale is that it also provides an ideal shelter for the fungi which may overwinter in the bird and then emerge in the spring infecting the rest of the plant as shown in the figure again this is a bird scale so when handling the plants which use the bird scales to provide overwintering protection to the birds it is important to avoid the disturbing the bird scales knocking the scale off or pinching it may interfere with the health of the underlying bird which could cause the problem for the plant in the following spring conversely pruning and manipulation of the birds can be done during the dormant winter months by the experienced gardens gardeners and to control the plant growth to achieve the adhesive objective as shown in this figure so again this is a bird scale people may also use the term bird scale in reference to spruce bird scale disease a type of the parasitic infection which can be very damaging to the trees the disease is characterized by the appearance of the small scales on the tree which house the insects and their eggs insects can overwinter emerging in the spring to cause the considerable damage and trees with bird scale disease are vulnerable to the fungal infection as shown in the figure so the next modification of the leaves is the leaflet hooks in this figure you can see very clearly that this is a leaflet hook as shown in the figure in the doxantha which is also known as the bignonia anguiscati commonly called as the cat's nail three terminal leaflets of the compound leaf are modified into a sharp pointed and curved hooks the hooks cling to the bark of the sporting tree and allow the plant to climb up as shown in the figure so again this is a leaflet hook in the doxantha you can see in this figure this is the stem these are adventitious root this is normal leaflet and these are the leaflet hooks some plants have their terminal leaflets which are modified into the hook like structures which act in the climbing for example in the bignonia anguiscati and in doxantha as shown in the figure again this is the leaflet hooks of the bignonia anguiscati as shown in this figure these are the hooks which are present in bignonia you can see very clearly in this picture so the terminal leaflets are modified into the curved hooks for climbing for example bignonia so again this is the leaflet hooks in the bignonia leaflet hooks you can see very clear in this picture of the bignonia so some plants most mostly modify their terminal leaflets into hooks that help the climbers to hold on to its substrate in bignonia anguiscati the terminal leaflets turn into three three hooks and help the plant to climb in bignonia anguiscati the three terminal leaflets of the leaf get modified into a claw like hooks which help them in climbing as shown in this figure so in modifications of the leaves these are the different modifications of the leaves and i will discuss them one by one so the first modification in this figure is the leaf tendril and the leaf tendril contains the upper leaflets which are modified into tendrils in certain plants having the weak stem entire leaf or part of the leaf gets modified into an elongated thin cylindrical coiled wiry sensitive structure which is known as the tendril and these tendrils help the plant to climb up on the some spot in wild pea which is also called as the lithyris entire leaf is tendrular 
in the sweet pea which is called as Pisum stivum. The terminal leaflets are tendrular in the gloriosa only the upper leaf apex modified into the tendril and in smilex the stipules become tendrular as shown in this figure. Next modification of the leaves is the leaf spines and the leaf spines contain the leaves which are modified as spines. So leaves of the certain plants become hoody or partially modified for the defensive purpose into sharp pointed structures which are known as spines. Sometimes only a part of the leaf such as the stipules get modified into spines to protect the plants from grazing animals. For example, in Zizifus and Acacia, in Barbary, the leaf itself becomes modified into a spine while the leaves of the axillary bird are normal. Next modification of the leaves is the scale leaves. So in this figure, you can see that the scale leaves contain the stem and the scale leaves are present. These are the small, dry, membranous brown or white leaves which are found in the Casorina and Rescus as shown in the figure. So, the next modification of the leaves is the phyllot. In the sun plants, the petiole becomes flat, green and leaf-like and performs the photosynthesis. This is known as a phyllot. So, there are about 300 species of the Australian acacia, all showing the phyllot. In this figure, you can see that these are the leaflets and this is the phyllote which is also known as the rachis as shown in this figure. Next modification of the leaf is known as the pitcher or insect eating plant. In the pitcher plant or napentes the leaf becomes modified into a pitcher. There is a slender stalk which coils like a tendril holding the pitcher vertical and the basal portion is flattened like a leaf. The pitcher is provided with a lid which covers the mouth. The function of the pitcher is to capture and digest the insects. As shown in this figure. So again these are the different modifications of the leaves. And in the first modification you can see the figure of the leaf tendril of Lithyrus. And these are the stipules here. Next figure is of the smilex which contains the tendril stipules and uh, next figure is uh, contains the leaf tendrils and leaf hooks which shows the hooks which are present in the bignonia. Next figure shows the leaf spines and stipules as shown in the figure and next figure shows the phyllote. This is the stem, this is leaflet and phyllote patio which is present in the acacia. So the first modification is the leaf tendrils. For example, in the wild pea, here the stem is very weak and hence they have the, some special organs for the attachment to the sport. So tendril is a slender wiry coil structure which helps in climbing the sport in Lithyrus. The entire leaf is modified into tendril. In the smilex, the stipules become modified into a tendril. Next modification is the leaf hooks. For example, in the bignonia. So in this, the leaves are modified into hooks and help the plant to climb the sport. For example, in the bignonia anguiscati, the three terminal leaflets of the compound leaves become stiff, curved and claw-like hooks. Next modification is the leaf spines. In this type, the leaves become wholly or partially modified into sharp pointed structures known as spines and this modification helps the plant to cut down the transpiration and also protects the plants against the grazing animals. Any part of the leaf may get modified into the spine, for example, in the zizipus, as shown in the figure. Next modification of the leaf is the phyllote. In the acacia, the patiole or any part of the rachis becomes flattened or winged, taking the shape of the leaf and turning green in color. This flattened or winged petiole or diracus is known as the phyllote. The normal leaf which is pinnately compound 
develops in the young stage but soon falls off. The phyllode then performs the functions of the leaf. The wing of the phyllode normally develops into the vertical direction so that the sunlight cannot fall on its surface. This reduces the evaporation of water and there are about 300 species of Australian acacia all showing the phyllode as shown in this figure. So these are all the different modifications of the leaves. Next I am going to discuss about the leaf duration. Leaf duration. On the basis of the lifespan or duration of a leaf on the plant it may be of the three types. And the first type is the caducus or fugacious. The leaves which fall soon alter their appearance, for example, in the appendia. Next type of the duration is the deciduous or annual. The leaves which fall off at the end of the growing season or in winter, for example, in the mulberry and poplar. Next type of the leaf duration is the persistent or evergreen, the leaves which survive for more than one year and fall off individually at different times for example in mango, pinus and eucalyptus etc. So these are the different types of the leaf duration and the first type is known as the caducus or fugacious. So these are the caducus sepals as shown in this figure. So in this type of the leaf duration Leaves which fall off soon alter their appearance and falling off soon after formation, for example, appendia or caesus, quadrant gularius, quadrant gularius, as shown in this figure. Next type of the leaf duration is the deciduous or annual. In this type, the leaves which fall off at the end of the growing season or in winter and falling at the end of the growing season so that the plant tree or shrub is leafless in winter summer season for example in the maple plumeria and lonia and in the erythrina as shown in the figure so the next type of the leaf duration is the persistent or evergreen. So the leaves survive for more than one year and fall off individually at different times and leaves which persist throughout the year falling regularly so that the tree is never leafless. For example in the mimosoups and calophyllum as shown in the figure. And other type of the leaf duration is also known as the marcescent. In marcescent condition the leaves not falling but withering on the plant as in several members of the Fagaceae. If you like my video please subscribe to my YouTube channel and press the bell icon as well for further notifications. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for your time and appreciation.